the third, or Master Mason's degree. The traditional account of the death, several burials, and resurrection of Hiram R. Beef, the widow's son, as hereafter narrated, admitted as facts, this degree is certainly very interesting. The Bible informs us, that there was a person of that name employed at the building of King Solomon's temple, but neither the Bible, the writings of Josephus, nor any other writings, however ancient, of which I have any knowledge, furnish any information respecting his death. It is very singular, that a man, so celebrated as Hiram Arbif was, an arbiter between Solomon, king of Israel, and Hiram, king of Tyre, universally acknowledged as the third most distinguished man then living, and, in many respects, the greatest man in the world, should pass off the stage of action, in the presence of King Solomon, 3,300 grand overseers, and 150,000 workmen, with whom he had spent a number of years, and neither King Solomon, his bosom friend, nor any other among his numerous friends, even recorded his death or anything about him. A person, who has received the two preceding degrees, and wishes to be raised to the sublime degree of a master mason, is, the lodge being opened as in the preceding degrees, conducted from the preparation room to the door, the manner of preparing him is particularly explained in the lecture, where he gives three distinct knocks, when the senior warden rises and says, worshipful, while we are peaceably at work on the third degree of masonry, under the influence of humanity, brotherly love, and affection. The door of our lodge appears to be alarmed. The master to the junior deacon, brother junior, inquire the cause of that alarm. The junior deacon then steps to the door and answers the three knocks that have been given, by three more, the knocks are much louder than those given on any occasion, other than that of the admission of candidates in the several degrees, one knock is then given without, and answered by one from within, when the door is partly opened, and the junior deacon asks, who comes there? Who comes there? Who comes there? The senior deacon answers, a worthy brother who has been regularly initiated as an entered apprentice mason, passed to the degree of a fellow craft, and now wishes for further light in masonry, by being raised to the sublime degree of a master mason. Junior deacon to senior deacon, is it of his own free will and accord he makes this request? Answer? It is. Junior deacon to senior deacon, is he worthy and well qualified? Answer? He is. Junior deacon to senior deacon, has he made suitable proficiency in the preceding degrees? Answer? He has. Junior deacon to senior deacon, by what further right does he expect to obtain this benefit? Answer? By the benefit of a password. Junior deacon to senior deacon, has he a password? Answer? He has not, but I have got it for him. The junior deacon to senior deacon, will you give it to me? The senior deacon then whispers in the ear of the junior deacon, Tubal Cain Jr. Deacon says, the pass is right. Since this is the case, you will wait till the worshipful master be made acquainted with his request, and his answer returned. The junior deacon then repairs to the master, and gives three knocks, as at the door, after answering which, the same questions are asked and answers returned, as at the door, when the master says, since he comes endued with all these necessary qualifications, let him enter this worshipful lodge in the name of the Lord, and take heed on what he enters. The junior deacon returns to the door and says, let him enter this worshipful lodge in the name of the Lord, and take heed on what he enters. In entering, both points of the compass are pressed against his naked right and left breasts, when the junior deacon stops the candidate, and says, brother, when you first entered this lodge, you was received on the point of the compass pressing your naked left breast, which was then explained to you, when you entered it the second time, you was received on the angle of the square, which was also explained to you, on entering it now. You are received on the two extreme points of the compass pressing your naked right and left breasts, which are thus explained, as the most vital parts of man are contained between the two breasts, so are the most valuable tenets of masonry contained between the two extreme points of the compass, which are, virtue, morality, and brotherly love. The senior deacon then conducts the candidate three times regularly round the lodge. I wish the reader to observe, that on this, as well as every other degree, the junior warden is the first of the three principal officers that the candidate passes, travelling with the sun, when he starts round the lodge, and as he passes the junior warden, senior warden, and master, the first time going round they each give one rap, the second time, two raps, and the third time, three raps. The number of raps given, on those occasions, 
are the same as the number of the degree, except the first degree, on which three are given, I always thought improperly, during the time the candidate is traveling round the room, the master reads the following passage of scripture, the conductor and candidate traveling, and the master reading, so that the traveling and reading terminates at the same time, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, while the sun, or the moon, or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the doors shall be shut in the streets, when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burthen, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth, as it was, and the spirit return unto God who gave it. The conductor and candidate halt at the junior warden in the south, where the same questions are asked and answers returned, as at the door, he is then conducted to the senior warden in the west, where the same questions are asked and answers returned, as before, from thence he is conducted to the worshipful master in the east, who asks the same questions and receives the same answers, as before, and who likewise asks the candidate, from whence he came, and whither he is travelling. Answer? From the west, and travelling to the east. Question. Why do you leave the west, and travel to the east? Answer? In search of more light. The master then says to the senior deacon, you will please conduct the candidate back to the west, from whence he came, and put him in care of the senior warden, and request him to teach the candidate how to approach the east, by advancing upon three upright regular steps to the third step, his feet forming a square, his body erect at the altar before the worshipful master, and place him in a proper position to take upon him the solemn oath, or obligation, of a master mason. The master then comes to the candidate and says, Brother, you are now placed in a proper position, the lecture explains it, to take upon you the solemn oath, or obligation, of a master mason, which I assure you, as before, is neither to affect your religion nor politics. If you are willing to take it, repeat your name, and say after me. I. A. Be of my own free will and accord, in presence of Almighty God, and this worshipful lodge of master masons, erected to God, and dedicated to the holy order of St. John, do hereby and hereon, most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear, in addition to my former obligations, that I will not give the degree of a master mason to any one of an inferior degree, nor to any other being in the known world, except it be to a true and lawful brother, or brethren, master mason, or within the body of a just and lawfully constituted lodge of such, and not unto him, nor unto them, whom I shall hear so to be, but unto him and them only whom I shall find so to be after strict trial and due examination, or lawful information received. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will not give the master's word, which I shall hereafter receive, neither in the lodge, nor out of it, except it be on the five points of fellowship, and then not above my breath. Furthermore, do I promise and swear, that I will not give the grand hailing sign of distress, except I am in real distress, or for the benefit of the craft when at work, and should I ever see that sign given, or the word accompanying it, and the person who gave it appearing to be in distress, I will fly to his relief at the risk of my life, should there be a greater probability of saving his life than of losing my own. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will not wrong this lodge, nor a brother of this degree, to the value of one cent, knowingly, myself, nor suffer it to be done by others, if in my power to prevent it. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will not be at the initiating, passing, and raising a candidate at one communication, without a regular dispensation from the Grand Lodge for the same? Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will not be at the initiating, passing, or raising, a candidate in a clandestine lodge, I knowing it to be such? Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will not be at the initiating of an old man in dotage, a young man in nonage, an atheist, irreligious libertine, idiot, madman, hermaphrodite, nor woman. Note. Masonry professes to bring men to heaven, and yet it denies its blessings to a large majority of the human family. 
all the fair part of creation, together with the old, young and poor, are exempted. How unlike the glorious gospel of the Son of God. In this there is no restriction of persons, the high and low, rich and poor, bond and free, male and female, are all one in Christ Jesus. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will not speak evil of a brother Master Mason, neither behind his back, nor before his face, but will apprise him of all approaching danger if in my power. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will not violate the chastity of a Master Mason's wife, mother, sister, or daughter, I knowing them to be such, nor suffer it to be done by others, if in my power to prevent it. Note. I ask the candid reader if this is morality or benevolence. If a mason was sworn not to violate the chastity of any woman, it would have more the appearance of virtuous principle. But would a mason's oath restrain a man, who would be guilty of such crimes? If masonry inculcated the true principles of morality the fruit would be manifest, I have been acquainted with many masons, but never knew one made better by masonry, but on the contrary, numbers, who, through its demoralizing influence have been rendered worthless. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will support the constitution of the Grand Lodge of the State of, under which this lodge is held, and conform to all the bylaws, rules, and regulations of this or any other lodge of which I may at any time hereafter become a member. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will obey all regular signs, summons, or tokens, given, handed, sent, or thrown, to me from the hand of a brother master mason, or from the body of a just and lawfully constituted lodge of such, provided it be within the length of my cable toe. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that a master mason's secrets, given to me in charge as such, and I knowing them to be such, shall remain as secure and inviolable in my breast as in his own, when communicated to me, murder and treason accepted, and they left to my own election. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will go on a master mason's errand, whenever required, even should I have to go barefoot, and bareheaded, if within the length of my cable toe. Note. Literally a rope several yards in length, but mystically three miles, so that a master mason must go on a brother master mason's errand whenever required, the distance of three miles, should he have to go barefoot and bareheaded. In the degrees of knighthood the distance is forty miles. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will always remember a brother master mason, when on my knees, offering up my devotions to Almighty God. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will be aiding and assisting all poor, indigent Master Masons, their wives and orphans, wheresoever disposed round the globe, as far as in my power, without injuring myself or family materially. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that if any part of this my solemn oath or obligation be omitted at this time, that I will hold myself amenable thereto, whenever informed. To all which I do most solemnly and sincerely promise and swear, with a fixed and steady purpose of mind in me, to keep and perform the same, binding myself under no less penalty, than to have my body severed in two in the midst, and divided to the north and south, my bowels burnt to ashes in the centre and the ashes scattered before the four winds of heaven, that there might not the least track or trace of remembrance remain among men or masons of so vile and perjured a wretch as I should be. Were I ever to prove willfully guilty of violating any part of this my solemn oath or obligation of a master mason, so help me God, and keep me steadfast in the due performance of the same. The master then asks the candidate, What do you most desire? The candidate answers after his prompter, More light. The bandage which was tied round his head in the preparation room, is, by one of the brethren who stands behind him for that purpose, loosened and put over both eyes, and he is immediately brought to light in the same manner as in the preceding degree, except three stamps on the floor, and three claps of the hands are given in this degree. On being brought to light, the master says to the candidate, you first discover, as before, three great lights in masonry, by the assistance of three lesser, with this difference, both points of the compass are elevated above the square, which denotes to you that you are about to receive all the light that can be conferred on you in a master's lodge. The master steps back from the candidate and says, brother, you now discover me as master of this lodge, approaching you from the east, under the sign and due guard of a master mason. The sign is given by raising both hands and arms to the elbows perpendicularly, one on either side of the head, the elbows forming a square. The words accompanying this sign in case of distress, are, O Lord my God, is there no help for the widow's son? As the last words drop from your lips you let your hands fall in that manner, 
best calculated to indicate solemnity. King Solomon is said to have made this exclamation on the receipt of the information of the death of Hiram Arbif. Masons are all charged never to give the words except in the dark when the sign cannot be seen. Here Masons differ very much, some contend that Solomon gave this sign, and made this exclamation, when informed of Hiram's death, and work accordingly in their lodges. Others say the sign was given, and the exclamation made at the grave when Solomon went there to raise Hiram, and of course they work accordingly, that is to say, the master, who governs a lodge, holding the latter opinion, gives the sign, etc. at the grave, when he goes to raise the body, and vice versa. The due guard is given by putting the right hand to the left side of the bowels, the hand open, with the thumb next to the belly, and drawing it across the belly, and let it fall, this is done tolerably quick. After the master has given the sign and due guard, which does not take more than a minute, he says, Brother, I now present you with my right hand in token of brotherly love and affection, and with it the pass grip and word. The pass grip is given by pressing the thumb between the joints of the second and third fingers, where they join the hand, and the word or name is Tubal Cain. It is the pass word to the master's degree. The master after giving the candidate the pass grip and word, bids him rise and salute the junior and senior wardens, and convince them that he is an obligated master mason, and is in possession of the pass grip and word. While the wardens are examining the candidate, the master returns to the east and gets an apron, and as he returns to the candidate, one of the wardens, sometimes both, says to the master, Worshipful, we are satisfied that B.R. is an obligated master mason. The master then says to the candidate, Brother, I now have the honor to present with a you lamb skin, or white apron, as before, which, I hope, you will continue to wear with credit to yourself, and satisfaction and advantage to the brethren, you will please carry it to the senior warden in the west, who will teach you how to wear it as a master mason. The senior warden ties on his apron, and lets the flap fall down before in its natural and common situation. The master returns to his seat, and the candidate is conducted to him. Master to candidate, Brother, I perceive you are dressed, it is, of course, necessary you should have tools to work with, I will now present you with the working tools of a master mason, and explain their uses to you. The working tools of a master mason are all the implements of masonry indiscriminately, but more especially the trowel. The trowel is an instrument made use of by operative masons to spread the cement which unites a building into one common mass, but we, as free and accepted masons, are taught to make use of it for the more noble and glorious purpose of spreading the cement of brotherly love and affection, that cement which unites us into one sacred band or society of friends and brothers, among whom no contention should ever exist, but that noble contention, or rather emulation, of who can best work, or best agree. I also present you with three precious jewels, their names are humanity, friendship, and brotherly love. Brother, you are not yet invested with all the secrets of this degree, nor do I know whether you ever will, until I know how you withstand the amazing trials and dangers that await you. You are now about to travel to give us a specimen of your fortitude, perseverance, and fidelity, in the preservation of what you have already received, fare you well and may the Lord be with you, and support you through your trials and difficulties. In some lodges they make him pray before he starts, the candidate is then conducted out of the lodge, clothed, and returns, as he enters the door, his conductor says to him, Brother, we are now in a place representing the Sanctum Sanctorum, or Holy of Holies, of King Solomon's Temple. It was the custom of our Grand Master, Hiram Arbif, every day at high twelve, when the crafts were from labor to refreshment, to enter into the Sanctum Sanctorum, and offer up his devotions to the ever-living God, let us, in imitation of him, kneel and pray. They then kneel and the conductor says the following prayer. Thou, O God, knowest our down sitting and uprising, and understandest our thoughts afar off, shield and defend us from the evil intentions of our enemies, and support us under the trials and afflictions we are destined to endure, while travelling through this veil of tears. Man that is born of a woman is of few days, and full of trouble, he cometh forth as a flower, and is cut down, he fleeth also as a shadow, and continueth not. Seeing his days are determined the number of his months are with thee, Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass, turn from him that he may rest, till he shall accomplish his day. For there is hope of a tree if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. But man dieth and wasteth away, yea, 
man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? As the waters fail from the sea, and flood decayeth and drieth up, so man leeth down, and riseth not up till the heavens shall be no more. Yet, O Lord, have compassion on the children of thy creation, administer unto them comfort in time of trouble, and save them with an everlasting salvation. Amen, so mote it be. They then rise and the conductor says to the candidate, Brother, in further imitation of our Grand Master, Hiram our beef, let us retire at the south gate. They then advance to the junior warden, who represents you Bella, one of the ruffians, who exclaims, Who comes here? The room is dark, or the candidate had winked, the conductor answers, Our Grand Master, Hiram our beef. We Grand Master, Hiram our beef. Exclaims the ruffian, He is the very man I wanted to see. Seizing the candidate by the throat at the same time, and jerking him about with violence, give me the master mason's word, or I'll take your life. The conductor replies, I cannot give it now, but if you will wait till the Grand Lodge assembles at Jerusalem, if you are worthy, you shall then receive it, otherwise you cannot. The ruffian then gives the candidate a blow with a 24-inch gauge across the throat, on which he fled to the west gate, where he was accosted by the second ruffian, Jubilo, with more violence, and on his refusal to comply with his request, he gave him a severe blow with the square across his breast, on which he attempted to make his escape at the east gate, where he was accosted by the third ruffian, Jubilum, with still more violence, and refusing to comply with his request. The ruffian gave him a viclant blow with the common gavel on the forehead, which brought him to the floor, on which one of them exclaimed, What shall we do? We have killed our grand master, Hiram our beef. Another answers, Let us carry him out at the east gate, and bury him in the rubbish till low twelve, and then meet and carry him a westerly course and bury him. The candidate is then taken up in a blanket, on which he fell, and carried to the west end of the lodge, and covered up and left, by this time the master has resumed his seat, King Solomon is supposed to arrive at the temple at this juncture, and calls to order, and asks the senior warden the cause of all that confusion, the senior warden answers, our grand master, Hiram our beef, is missing, and there are no plans or designs laid down on the trestle board for the crafts to pursue their labor. The master, alias King Solomon, replies, Our Grand Master missing. Our Grand Master has always been very punctual in his attendance, I fear he is indisposed, assemble the crafts, and search in and about the temple, and see if he can be found. They all shuffle about the floor a while, when the master calls them to order, and asks the senior warden, What success? He answers, we cannot find our Grand Master, my Lord. The Master then orders the Secretary to call the roll of workmen, and see whether any of them are missing. The Secretary calls the roll, and says, I have called the roll, my Lord, and find that there are three missing, viz. Jubela, Jubilo and Jubilum. His Lordship then observes, This brings to my mind a circumstance that took place this morning, twelve fellow crafts, clothed in white gloves and aprons, in token of their innocence, came to me, and confessed that they twelve, with three others, had conspired to extort the master mason's word from their grand master, Hiram Arbeef, and in case of refusal to take his life, they twelve had recanted, but feared the other three had been base enough to carry their atrocious designs into execution. Solomon then ordered twelve fellow crafts to be drawn from the bands of the workmen, clothed in white gloves and aprons, in token of their innocence, and sent three east, three west, three north, and three south, in search of the ruffians, and if found, to bring them forward. Here the members all shuffle about the floor a while, and fall in with a reputed traveller, and inquire of him if he had seen any travelling men that way, he tells them that he had seen three that morning near the coast of Joppa, who from their dress and appearance were Jews, and were workmen from the temple, inquiring for a passage to Ethiopia, but were unable to obtain one, in consequence of an embargo which had recently been laid on all the shipping, and had turned back into the country. The master now calls them to order again, and asks the senior warden, what success? He answers by relating what had taken place, Solomon observes, I had this embargo laid to prevent the ruffians from making their escape, and adds, you will go and search again, and search till you find them, if possible, and if they are not found, the twelve, who confessed, shall be considered as the reputed murderers, and suffer accordingly. The members all start again, and shuffle about a while, until one of them, as if by accident, finds the body of Hiram Arbeef, alias the candidate, and hails his travelling companions who join him, and while they are humming out something over the candidate, 
the three reputed ruffians, who are seated in a private corner near the candidate, are heard to exclaim in the following manner, first, Jubella, oh, that my throat had been cut across, my tongue torn out, and my body buried in the rough sands of the sea at low water mark, where the tide ebbs and flows twice in twenty-four hours, ere I had been accessory to the death of so good a man as our Grand Master, Hiram Arbeef. The second, Jubilo, oh that my left breast had been torn open, and my heart and vitals taken from thence, and thrown over my left shoulder, carried into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and there to become a prey to the wild beasts of the field, and vultures of the air, ere I had conspired the death of so good a man as our Grand Master, Hiram Arbeef. The third, Jubilum, oh that my body had been severed in two in the midst, and divided to the north and south, my bowels burnt to ashes in the center, and the ashes scattered by the four winds of heaven, that there might not the least track or trace of remembrance remain among men, or masons, of so vile and perjured a wretch as I am, ah, Jubella and Jubilo, it was I that struck him harder than you both, it was I that gave him the fatal blow, it was I that killed him outright. The three fellow crafts who had stood by the candidate all this time listening to the ruffians, whose voices they recognized, says one to the other, what shall we do, there are three of them, and only three of us. It is, said one, in reply, our cause is good, let us seize them, on which they rush forward, and carry them to the master, to whom they relate what had passed, the master then addresses them in the following manner, they in many lodges kneel, or lie down in token of their guilt and penitence, well, Jubella, what have you got to say for yourself, guilty or not guilty? Answer? Guilty, my lord. Jubilo, guilty or not guilty? Answer? Guilty, my lord. Jubilum, guilty or not guilty? Answer? Guilty, my lord. The master of the three fellow crafts, who took them, take them without the west gate of the temple, and have them executed according to the several imprecations of their own mouths. They are then hurried off to the west end of the room. Here this part of the farce ends. The master then orders fifteen fellow crafts to be elected from the bands of the workmen, and sent three east, three west, three north, three south, and three in and about the temple in search of their grand master, Hiram Arbeef. In some lodges they only send twelve, when their own lectures say fifteen were sent, and charges them if they find the body to examine carefully on and about it for the master's word or a key to it. The three that travel the westerly course, come to the candidate and finger about him a little and are called to order by the master, when they report that they have found the grave of their grandmaster, Hiram Arbeef, and on moving the earth till they came to the body, they involuntarily found their hands raised in this position. Showing it at the same time, it is the due guard of this degree. To guard their nostrils against the offensive effluvia which arose from the grave, and that they had searched carefully on and about the body for the master's word, but had not discovered anything but a faint resemblance of the letter G on the left breast. The master on the receipt of this information, raising himself, raises his hands three several times above his head, as herein before described, and exclaims twice, nothing but faint resemblance of the letter G. That is not the master's word, nor a key to it. I fear the master's word is forever lost. The third exclamation is different from the others attend to it, it has been described in page 64, nothing but a faint resemblance of the letter G. That is not the master's word nor a key to it. O oh Lord my God, is there no help for the widow's son? The master then orders the junior warden to summon a lodge of entered apprentice masons, and repair to the grave to raise the body of their grand master, by the entered apprentice's grip. They go to the candidate, and take hold of his forefinger and pull it, return and tell the master that they could not raise him by the entered apprentice's grip, that the skin cleaved from the bone. A lodge of fellow crafts are then sent, who act as before, except they pull the candidate's second finger. The master then directs the senior warden, generally, to summon a lodge of master masons, and says, I will go with them myself in person, and try to raise the body by the master's grip, or lion's paw. Some say by the strong grip, or the lion's paw, they then all assemble round the candidate, the master having declared the first word spoken after the body was raised, should be adopted as a substitute for the master's word, for the government of Master Mason's lodges in all future generations, he proceeds to raise the candidate, alias, the representative of the dead body of Hiram Arbeef. He, the candidate, is raised on what is called the five points of fellowship, which are foot to foot, knee to knee, breast to breast, hand to back, and mouth to ear. 
This is done by putting the inside of your right foot to the inside of the right foot of the person to whom you are going to give the word, the inside of your knee to his, laying your right breast against his, your left hands on the back of each other, and your mouths to each other's right ear, in which position you are alone permitted to give the word, and whisper the word Maha Bone. The master's grip is given by taking hold of each other's right hand, as though you were going to shake hands, and sticking the nails of each of your fingers into the joint of the other's wrist where it unites with the hand. In this position the candidate is raised, he keeping his whole body stiff, as though dead. The master in raising him is assisted by some of the brethren, who take hold of the candidate by the arms and shoulders, as soon as he is raised to his feet they step back, and the master whispers the word Maha Bone in his ear, and causes the candidate to repeat it, telling him at the same time that he must never give it in any manner other than that which he receives it. He is also told that Maha Bone, signifies marrow in the bone. They then separate, and the master makes the following explanation, respecting the five points of fellowship. Master to candidate, brother, foot to foot, teaches you that you should, whenever asked, go on a brother's errand if within the length of your cable toe, even if you should have to go barefoot and bareheaded. Knee to knee, that you should always remember a master mason in your devotion of Almighty God. Breast to breast, that you should keep the master mason's secrets, when given to you in charge as such, as secure and inviolable in your breast, as they were in his own, before communicated to you. Hand to back, that you should support a master mason behind his back, as well as before his face. Mouth to ear, that you should support his good name, as well behind his back as before his face. After the candidate is through with what is called the work part, the master addresses him in the following manner, Brother you may suppose from the manner you have been dealt with tonight, that we have been fooling with you, or that we have treated you different from others, but assure you that is not the you have, this night, represented one of the greatest men that ever lived, in the tragical catastrophe of his death, burial, and resurrection, I mean Hiram Arbif, the widow's son, who was slain by three ruffians, at the building of King Solomon's temple, and who, in his inflexibility, integrity, and fortitude, never was surpassed by man. The history of that momentous event is thus related. Masonic tradition inform us, that at the building of King Solomon's temple, fifteen fellow crafts discovering that the temple was almost finished, and not having the master mason's word, became very impatient, and entered into a horrid conspiracy to extort the master mason's word from their grand master, Hiram Arbif, the first time they met him alone, or take his life, that they might pass as masters in other countries, and receive wages as such, but before they could accomplish their designs. Twelve of them recanted, but the other three were base enough to carry their atrocious designs into execution. Their names were Jubela, Jubilo, and Jubalum. It was the custom of our Grand Master, Hiram Arbif, every day at high twelve, when the crafts were from labor to refreshment, to enter into the Sanctum Sanctorum, and offer his devotions to the ever-living God, and draw out his plans and designs on the trestle board for the crafts to pursue their labor. On a certain day, not named in any of our traditional accounts, Jubela, Jubilo, and Jubilum, placed themselves at the south, west, and east gates of the temple, and Hiram having finished his devotions and labor, attempted, as was his usual custom, to retire at the south gate, where he was met by Jubela, who demanded of him the master mason's word, some say the secrets of a master mason, and on his refusal to give it, Jubita gave him a violent blow with a twenty-four-inch gauge across the throat, on which Hiram fled to the west gate, where he was accosted in the same manner by Jubilo, but with more violence. Hiram told him that he could not give the word then, because Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and himself, had entered into a solemn league, that the word never should be given, unless they three were present, but if he would have patience, till the Grand Lodge assembled at Jerusalem, if he was then found worthy he should then receive it, otherwise he could not, Jubilo replied in a very peremptory manner, if you do not give me the master's word. I'll take your life. And on Hiram's refusing to give it, Jubilo gave him a severe blow with the square across the left breast, on which he fled to the east gate where he was accosted by Jubilum, in the same manner, but with still more violence. Here Hiram reasoned as before, Jubilum told him that he had heard his cavilling with Jubela and Jubilo long enough, and that the master's word had been promised to him from time to time for a long time, that he was still put off, and that the temple was almost finished, and he was determined to have the word or take his life, I want it so that I may be able to get wages as a master mason, in any country to which I may go for employ, after the temple is finished. 
and that I may be able to support my wife and children. Hiram persisting in his refusal, he gave Hiram a violent blow with the gavel, on the forehead, which felled him to the floor and killed him they took the body and carried it out of the west gate, and buried it in the bish, till low twelve at night, which is twelve o'clock, when they three met agreeable to appointment, and carried the body a westerly course, and buried it at the brow of a hill, in a grave, dug due east and west six feet perpendicular, and made their escape. King Solomon coming up to the temple at low six in the morning, as was his usual custom, found the crafts all in confusion, and on inquiring the cause, was informed that their grand master, Hiram Arbif, was missing, and there was no plans and designs laid down on the trestle board, for the crafts to pursue their labor. Solomon ordered search to be made in and about the temple for him, no discovery being made, he then ordered the secretary to call the role of workmen to see if any were missing, it appearing that there were three, viz. Jubela, Jubilo, and Jubilum, Solomon observed, this brings to my mind a circumstance that took place this morning. Twelve fellow crafts came to me dressed in white gloves and aprons, in token of their innocence, and confessed that they twelve with three others, had conspired to extort the master mason's word from their grand master, Hiram Arbif, and in case of his refusal, to take his life, they twelve had recanted, but feared the other three had been base enough to carry their atrocious designs into execution. Solomon immediately ordered twelve fellow crafts to be selected from the bands of the workmen, clothed in white gloves and aprons in token of their innocence, and sent three east, three west, three north, and three south, in search of the ruffians, and if found, to bring them up before him. The three that travelled a westerly course, coming near the coast of Joppa, fell in with a wayfaring man who informed them that he had seen three men pass that way that morning, who, from their appearance and dress, were workmen from the temple, inquiring for a passage to Ethiopia, but were unable to obtain one in consequence of an embargo which had recently been laid on all the shipping, and had turned back into the country. After making further and more diligent search, and making no further discovery, they returned to the temple and reported to Solomon the result of their pursuit, and inquiries. On which Solomon directed them to go again and search until they found their grand master, Hiram Arbif, if possible, and if he was not found, the twelve who had confessed, should be considered as the murderers, and suffer accordingly. They returned again in pursuit of the ruffians, and one of the three that travelled a westerly course, being more weary than the rest, sat down at the brow of a hill to rest and refresh himself, and in attempting to rise, caught hold of a sprig of cassia, which easily gave, and excited his curiosity, and made him suspicious of a deception, on which he hailed his companions, who immediately assembled, and on examination, found that the earth had been recently moved, and on moving the rubbish, discovered the appearance of the grave, and while they were confabulating about what measures to take, they heard voices issuing from a cavern in the clefts of the rocks, on which, they immediately repaired to the place, where they heard the voice of Jubela exclaim, Oh! That my throat had been cut across, my tongue torn out, and my body buried in the rough sands of the sea, at low water mark, where the tide ebbs and flows twice in twenty-four hours, ere I had been accessory to the death of so good a man as our Grand Master, Hiram Arbif, on which, they distinctly heard the voice of Jubilo exclaim, Oh! That my left breast had been torn open, and my heart and vitals taken from thence and thrown over my left shoulder, carried into the valley of Jehoshaphat, there to become a prey to the wild beasts of the field and vultures of the air, ere I had conspired to take the life of so good a man as our Grand Master, Hiram Arbif, when they more distinctly heard the voice of Jubilum exclaim, Oh! That my body had been severed in two in the midst, and divided to the north and the south, my bowels burnt to ashes in the centre, and the ashes scattered by the four winds of heaven, that there might not remain the least trace of remembrance among men, or masons, of so vile and perjured a wretch as I am, who willfully took the life of so good a man as our Grand Master, Hiram Arbif. Ah! Jubela and Jubilo, it was I that struck him harder than you both. It was I that gave him the fatal blow. It was I that killed him outright. On which, they rushed forward, seized, bound, and carried them before King Solomon, who, after hearing the testimony of the three fellow crafts, and the three ruffians having plead guilty, ordered them to be taken out at the west gate of the temple, and executed agreeably to the several imprecations of their own mouths. King Solomon then ordered fifteen fellow crafts to be selected from the ban of the workmen, clothed with white gloves and aprons, in token of their innocence, and sent three east, three west, three north, three south, and three in and about the temple, 
in search of the body of our Grand Master, Hiram Arbeef, and the three that travel the westerly course found it under a sprig of cassia, where a worthy brother sat down to rest and refresh himself, and on removing the earth till they came to the coffin. They involuntarily found their hands raised, as herein before described, to guard their nostrils against the offensive effluvia that rose from the grave. It is also said, that the body had lain there fourteen days, some say, fifteen. The body was raised in the manner herein before described, carried up to the temple, and buried as explained in the closing clauses of the lecture. Not one third part of the preceding history of this degree is ever given to a candidate. A few general, desultory, unconnected remarks are made to him, and he is generally referred to the manner of raising, and to the lecture, for information as to the particulars. Here follows a charge which ought to be, and sometimes is, delivered to the candidate after hearing the history of the degree. An address to be delivered to the candidate after the history has been given. Brother, your zeal for the institution of masonry, the progress you have made in the mystery, and your conformity to our regulations, have pointed you out as a proper object of our favor and esteem. You are bound, by duty, honor, and gratitude, to be faithful to your trust, to support the dignity of your character on every occasion, and to enforce, by precept and example, obedience to the tenets of the order. In the character of a master mason, you are authorized to correct the errors and irregularities of your uninformed brethren, and to guard them against a breach of fidelity. To preserve the reputation of the fraternity unsullied, must be your constant care, and, for this purpose, it is your province to recommend to your inferiors, obedience and submission, to your equals, courtesy and affability, to your superiors, kindness and condescension. Universal benevolence you are always to inculcate, and, by the regularity of your own behavior, afford the best example for the conduct of others less informed. The ancient landmarks of the order, entrusted to your care, you are carefully to preserve, and never suffer them to be infringed, or countenance a deviation from the established usages and customs of the fraternity. Your virtue, honor, and reputation are concerned in supporting, with dignity, the character you now bear. Let no motive, therefore, make you swerve from your duty, violate your vow, or betray your trust, but be true and faithful, and imitate the example of that celebrated artist whom you this evening represent, thus you will render yourself deserving the honor which we have conferred, and merit the confidence that we have reposed. Here follows the lecture on this degree, which is divided into three sections. Question. Are you a master mason? Answer. I am, try me, prove me, disprove me if you can. Question. Where were you prepared to be made a master mason? Answer. In a room adjacent to the body of a just and lawfully constituted lodge of such, duly assembled in a room, representing the Sanctum Sanctorum, or Holy of Holies, of King Solomon's Temple. Question. How were you prepared? Answer. By being divested of all metals, neither naked nor clothed, barefooted nor shod, with a cable toe three times about my naked body, in which posture I was conducted to the door of the lodge, where I gave three distinct knocks. Question. What did those three distinct knocks allude to? Answer. To the third degree of masonry, it being that on which I was about to enter. Question. What was said to you from within? Answer. Who comes there, who comes there, who comes there? Question. Your answer. Answer. A worthy brother, who has been regularly initiated as an entered apprentice mason, passed to the degree of fellow craft, and now wishes for further light in masonry, by being raised to the sublime degree of a master mason. Question. What further was said to you from within? Answer. I was asked if it was of my own free will and accord I made this request, if I was duly and truly prepared, worthy and well qualified, and had made suitable proficiency in the preceding degrees, all of which being answered in the affirmative, I was asked, by what further rights I expected to obtain that benefit. Question. Your answer. Answer. By the benefit of a password. Question. What was that password? Answer. Tubal Cain. Question. What next was said to you? Answer. I was bid to wait till the worshipful master in the east was made acquainted with my request, and his answer returned. Question. After his answer was returned, what followed? Answer. I was caused to enter the lodge on the two extreme points of the compass, pressing my naked right and left breasts, in the name of the Lord. Question. 
How were you then disposed of? Answer? I was conducted three times regularly round the lodge, and halted at the junior warden in the south, where the same questions were asked and answers returned, as at the door. Question. How did the junior warden dispose of you? Answer? He ordered me to be conducted to the senior warden in the west, where the same questions were asked and answers returned, as before. Question. How did the senior warden dispose of you? Answer? He ordered me to be conducted to the worshipful master in the east, where the same questions were asked and answers returned, as before, who likewise demanded of me from whence I came, and whither I was traveling. Question. Your answer. Answer? From the west, and traveling to the east. Question. Why do you leave the west, and travel to the east? Answer? In search of light. Question. How did the worshipful master dispose of you? Answer. He ordered me to be conducted back to the west, from whence I came, and put in care of the senior warden, who taught me how to approach the east, by advancing upon three upright regular steps to the third step, my feet forming a square, and my body erect at the altar before the worshipful master. Question. What did the worshipful master do with you? Answer. He made an obligated master mason of me. Question. How? Answer. In due form. Question. What was that due form? Answer. Both my knees bare bent, they forming a square, both hands on the holy Bible, square, and compass, in which posture I took upon me the solemn oath, or obligation, of a master mason. Question. After your obligation, what was said to you? Answer. What do you most desire? Question. Your answer. Answer. More light. The bandage round the head, is now dropped over the eyes. Question. Did you receive light? Answer. I did. Question. On being brought to light, on this degree, what did you first discover? Answer. Three great lights in masonry, by the assistance of three less, and both points of the compass elevated above the square, which denoted to me that I had received, or was about to receive. All the light that could be conferred on me in a master's lodge. Question. What did you next discover? Answer. The worshipful master approaching me from the east, under the sign and due guard of a master mason, who presented me with his right hand in token of brotherly love and confidence, and proceeded to give me the pass grip and word of a master mason. The word is the name of the pass grip. And bid me rise and salute the junior and senior wardens, and convince them that I was an obligated master mason, and had the sign, pass grip, and word. Tubal Cain. Question. What did you next discover? Answer. The worshipful master approaching me, a second time, from the east, who presented me with a lamb skin, or white apron, which, he said, he hoped I would continue to wear with honor to myself, and satisfaction and advantage to the brethren. Question. What were you next presented with? Answer. The working tools of a master mason. Question. What are they? Answer. All the implements of masonry indiscriminately, but more especially the trowel. Question. How explained? Answer. The trowel is an instrument made use of by operative masons to spread the cement which unites a building into one common mass, but we, as free and accepted masons, are taught to make use of it for the more noble and glorious purpose of spreading the cement of brotherly love and affection, that cement, which unites us into one sacred band, or society, of brothers, among whom no contention should ever exist, but that noble emulation of who can best work, or best agree. Question. What were you next presented with? Answer. Three precious jewels. Question. What are they? Answer. Humanity, friendship, and brotherly love. Question. How were you then disposed of? Answer. I was conducted out of the lodge, and invested of what I had been divested, and returned again in due season. Section 2nd. Question. Did you ever return to the Sanctum Sanctorum, or Holy of Holies of King Solomon's Temple? Answer. I did. Question. Was there anything particular took place on your return? Answer. There was, viz. I was accosted by three ruffians, who demanded of me the Master Mason's word. Question. Did you ever give it to them? Answer. I did not, but bid them wait, with time and patience, till the Grand Lodge assembled at Jerusalem, and then, if they were found worthy, they should receive it, 
otherwise, they could not. Question. In what manner was you accosted? Answer. In attempting to retire at the south gate, I was accosted by one of them, who demanded of me the master mason's word, and, on my refusing to comply with his request, he gave me a blow with the twenty-four-inch gauge, across my breast, on which I fled to the west gate, where I was accosted by the second with more violence, and, on my refusing to comply with his request, he gave me a severe blow, with the square, across my breast, on which I attempted to make my escape at the east gate, where I was accosted by the third with still more violence, and, on my refusing to comply with his request, he gave me a violent blow, with common gavel, on the forehead, and brought me to the floor. Question. Whom did you represent at that time? Answer. Our Grand Master, Hiram Arbeef, who was slain at the building of King Solomon's temple. Question. Was his death premeditated? Answer. It was, by fifteen fellow crafts, who conspired to extort from him the Master Mason's word, twelve of whom recanted, but the other three were base enough to carry their atrocious designs into execution. Question. What did they do with the body? Answer. They carried it out at the west gate of the temple, and buried it till low twelve at night, when they three met agreeably to appointment, and carried it a westerly course from the temple, and buried it under the brow of a hill, in a grave six feet due east and west, six feet perpendicular, and made their escape. Question. What time was he slain? Answer. At high twelve at noon, when the crafts were from labor to refreshment. Question. How came he to be alone at that time? Answer. Because it was the usual custom of our Grand Master, Hiram Arbeef, every day, at high twelve, when the crafts were from labor to refreshment, to enter into the Sanctum Sanctorum, or Holy of Holies, and offer up his adorations to the ever-living God, and draw out his plans and designs on his trestle board for the crafts to pursue their labor. Question. At what time was he missing? Answer. At low six in the morning, when King Solomon came up to the temple, as usual, to view the work, and found the crafts all in confusion, and, on inquiring the cause, he was informed that their grand master, Hiram Arbeef, was missing, and no plans or designs were laid down on the trestle board for the crafts to pursue their labor. Question. What observations did King Solomon make at that time? Answer. He observed that our grand master, Hiram Arbeef, had always been very punctual in attending, and feared that he was indisposed, and ordered search to be made in and about the temple, to see if he could be found. Question. Search being made, and he not found, what further remarks did King Solomon make? Answer. He observed he feared some fatal accident had befallen our Grand Master, Hiram Arbeef, that morning twelve fellow crafts, clothed in white gloves and aprons in token of their innocence, had confessed that they twelve, with three others, had conspired to extort the master mason's word from their grand master, Hiram Arbeef, or take his life, that they twelve had recanted, but feared the other three had been base enough to carry their atrocious designs into execution. Question. What followed? Answer. King Solomon ordered the role of workmen to be called, to see if there were any missing. Question. The role being called, were there any missing? Answer. There were three, viz. Jubela, Jubilo, and Jubilum. Question. Were the ruffians ever found? Answer. They were. Question. How? Answer. By the wisdom of King Solomon, who ordered twelve fellow crafts to be selected from the bands of the workmen, clothed in white gloves and aprons, in token of their innocence, and sent three east, three west, three north, and three south, in search of the ruffians, and if found, to bring them forward. Question. What success? Answer. The three that traveled a westerly course from the temple, coming near the coast of Joppa, were informed, by a wayfaring man, that three men had been seen that way that morning, who, from their appearance and dress, were workmen from the temple, inquiring for a passage to Ethiopia, but were unable to obtain one, in consequence of an embargo, which had recently been laid on all the shipping, and had turned back into the country. Question. What followed? Answer. King Solomon ordered them to go and search again, and search till they were found if possible, and if they were not found, that the twelve, who had confessed, should be considered as the reputed murderers, and suffer accordingly. Question. What success? Answer. One of the three that traveled a westerly course from the temple, 
being more weary than the rest, sat down under the brow of a hill, to rest and refresh himself, and, in attempting to rise, caught hold of a sprig of cassia, which easily gave way, and excited his curiosity, and made him suspicious of a deception, on which he hailed his companions, who immediately assembled, and, on examination, found that the earth had recently been moved, and, on moving the rubbish, discovered the appearance of a grave. And while they were confabulating about what measures to take, they heard voices issuing from a cavern in the clefts of the rocks, on which they immediately repaired to the place, where they heard the voice of Jubela exclaim, Oh! That my throat had been cut across, my tongue torn out, and my body buried in the rough sands of the sea, at low water mark, where the tide ebbs and flows twice in twenty-four hours, ere I had been accessory to the death of so good a man as our grand master, Hiram Arbif, on which they distinctly heard the voice of Jubilo exclaim, Oh! That my left breast had been torn open, and my heart and vitals taken from thence, and thrown over my left shoulder, carried to the valley of Jehoshaphat, there to become a prey to the wild beasts of the field, and vultures of the air, ere I had conspired to take the life of so good a man as our grand master, Hiram Arbif, when they more distinctly heard the voice of Jubilum exclaim, Oh! That my body had been severed in two in the midst, and divided to the north and the south, my bowels burnt to ashes in the centre, and the ashes scattered by the four winds of heaven, that there might not remain the least track or trace of remembrance among men or masons, of so vile and perjured a wretch as I am, who willfully took the life of so good a man as our grand master, Hiram Arbif. Ah! Jubela and Jubilo, it was I that struck him harder than you both. It was I that gave him the fatal blow. It was I that killed him outright. On which they rushed forward, seized, bound, and carried them up before King Solomon. Question. What did King Solomon do with them? Answer. He ordered them to be executed agreeably to the several imprecations of their own mouths. Question. Was the body of our Grand Master, Hiram Arbif, ever found? Answer. It was. Question. How? Answer. By the wisdom of King Solomon, who ordered fifteen, in some lodges they say twelve, fellow crafts to be selected from the bands of the workmen, and sent three east, three west, three north, three south, and three in and about the temple, in search of the body. Question. Where was it found? Answer. Under that sprig of cassia where a worthy brother sat down to rest and refresh himself. Question. Was there anything particular took place on the discovery of the body? Answer. There was, viz. on removing the earth till they came to the coffin, they involuntarily found their hands raised in this position, to guard their nostrils against the offensive effluvia that rose from the grave. Question. How long had the body lain there? Answer. Fourteen days. Question. What did they do with the body? Answer. Raised it in a Masonic form, and carried it up to the temple for more decent interment. Question. Where was it buried? Answer. Under the Sanctum Sanctorum, or Holy of Holies of King Solomon's Temple, over which they erected a marble monument with this inscription delineated thereon, a virgin weeping over a broken column, with a book open before her, in her right hand a sprig of cassia, in her left, an urn, time standing behind her, with his hands enfolded in the ringlets of her hair. Question. What do they denote? Answer. The weeping virgin denotes the unfinished state of the temple, the broken column, that one of the principal supporters of masonry had fallen, the book open before her, that his memory was on perpetual record, the sprig of cassia, the timely discovery of his grave, the urn in her left hand, that his ashes were safely deposited under the sanctum sanctorum, or holy of holies of King Solomon's temple, and time, standing behind her with his hands enfolded in the ringlets of her hair, that time, patience, and perseverance will accomplish all things. Section 3rd. Question. What does a master's lodge represent? Answer. The sanctum sanctorum, or holy of holies of King Solomon's temple. Question. How long was the temple building? Answer. Seven years, during which, it rained not in the daytime, that the workmen might not be obstructed in their labor. Question. What supported the temple? Answer. 1453 columns, and 2906 pilasters, all hewn from the finest Parian marble. Question. What further supported it? Answer. Three grand columns, or pillars. Question. What were they called? Answer. 
wisdom, strength, and beauty. Question. What did they represent? Answer. The pillar of wisdom represented Solomon, king of Israel, whose wisdom contrived the mighty fabric, the pillar of strength, Hiram, king of Tyre, who strengthened. Solomon in his glorious undertaking, the pillar of beauty, Hiram Arbif, the widow's son, whose cunning craft and curious workmanship beautified and adorned the temple. Question. How many were there employed in the building of King Solomon's temple? Answer. Three grand masters, three thousand, three hundred masters, or overseers of the work, eighty thousand fellow crafts, and seventy thousand entered apprentices, all those were classed and arranged in such a manner, by the wisdom of Solomon, that neither envy, discord, nor confusion were suffered to interrupt that universal peace and tranquility that pervaded the work at that important period. Question. How many constitutes an entered apprentice's lodge? Answer. Seven, one master and six entered apprentices. Question. Where did they usually meet? Answer. On the ground floor of King Solomon's temple. Question. How many constitutes a fellow crafts lodge? Answer. Five, two masters and three fellow crafts. Question. Where did they usually meet? Answer. In the middle chamber of King Solomon's temple. Question. How many constitutes a master's lodge? Answer. Three master masons. Question. Where did they usually meet? Answer. In the sanctum sanctorum, or holy of holies of King Solomon's temple. Question. Have you any emblems on this degree? Answer. We have several, which are divided into two classes. Question. What are the first class? Answer. The pot of incense, the beehive, the book of constitutions, guarded by the tiler's sword, the sword, pointing to a naked heart, the all-seeing eye, the anchor and ark, the forty-seventh problem of Euclid, the hourglass, the scythe, and the three steps usually delineated on the master's carpet, which are thus explained, the pot of incense is an emblem of a pure heart, which is always an acceptable sacrifice to the deity, and as this glows with fervent heat. So should our hearts continually glow with gratitude to the great and beneficent author of our existence, for the manifold blessings and comforts we enjoy. The beehive is an emblem of industry, and recommends the practice of that virtue to all created beings, from the highest seraph in heaven to the lowest reptile of the dust. It teaches us, that, as we came into the world rational and intelligent beings, so we should ever be industrious ones, never sitting down contented, while our fellow creatures around us are in want, when it is in our power to relieve them, without inconvenience to ourselves. When we take a survey of nature, we behold man, in his infancy, more helpless and indigent than the brute creation, he lies languishing for days, weeks, months, and years, totally incapable of providing sustenance for himself, of guarding against the attacks of the field, or sheltering himself from the inclemencies of the weather. It might have pleased the great creator of heaven and earth, to have made man independent of all other beings, but, as dependence is one of the strongest bonds of society, mankind were made dependent on each other for protection and security, as they thereby enjoy better opportunities of fulfilling the duties of reciprocal love and friendship. Thus was man formed for social and active life, the noblest part of the work of God, and he, who will so demean himself as not to be endeavouring to add to the common stock of knowledge and understanding, may be deemed a drone in the hive of nature, a useless member of society, and unworthy of our protection as masons. The Book of Constitutions, guarded by the tiler's sword, reminds us that we should be ever watchful and guarded, in our thoughts, words, and actions, particularly when before the enemies of masonry, ever bearing in remembrance those truly masonic virtues, silence and circumspection. Sword, pointing to a naked heart, demonstrates that justice will sooner or later overtake us, and, although our thoughts, words, and actions may be hidden from the eyes of men, yet, that all-seeing eye, whom the sun, moon, and stars obey, and under whose watchful care even comets perform their stupendous revolutions, pervades the inmost recesses of the human heart, and will reward us according to our merits. The anchor and ark, are emblems of a well-grounded hope and well-spent life. They are emblematical of that divine ark which safely wafts us over this tempestuous sea of troubles, and that anchor which shall safely moor us in a peaceful harbour, where the wicked cease from troubling, and the weary shall find rest. The forty-seventh problem of Euclid, this was an invention of our ancient friend and brother, the great Pythagoras, who, 
in his travels through Asia, Africa, and Europe, was initiated into several orders of priesthood, and raised to the sublime degree of a master mason. The this wise philosopher enriched his mind abundantly in a general knowledge of things, and more especially in geometry, or masonry, on this subject he drew out many problems and theorems, and, among the most distinguished, he erected this, which in the joy of his heart, he called Eureka, in the Grecian language signifying, I have found it, and upon the discovery of which he is said to have sacrificed a hecatomb. It teaches masons to be general lovers of the arts and sciences. The hourglass is an emblem of human life. Behold! How swiftly the sands run, and how rapidly our lives are drawing to a close. We cannot without astonishment behold the little particles which are contained in this machine, how they pass away almost imperceptibly, and yet to our surprise, in the short space of an hour they are all exhausted. Thus wastes man. Today, he puts forth the tender leaves of hope, tomorrow, blossoms, and bears his blushing honors thick upon him, the next day comes a frost, which nips the shoot, and when he thinks his greatness is still ripening, he falls, like autumn leaves, to enrich our mother earth. The scythe is an emblem of time, which cuts the brittle thread of life, and launches us into eternity. Behold! What havoc the scythe of time makes among the human race, if, by chance, we should escape the numerous evils incident to childhood and youth, and, with health and vigor, arrive to the years of manhood, yet with all we must soon be cut down by the all-devouring scythe of time, and be gathered into the land where our fathers had gone before us. The three steps, usually delineated upon the master's carpet, are emblematical of the three principal stages of human life, viz. youth, manhood, and age. In youth, as entered apprentices, we ought industriously to occupy our minds in the attainment of useful knowledge in manhood, as fellow crafts, we should apply our knowledge to the discharge of our respective duties to God, our neighbors, and ourselves, so that, in age, as master masons, we may enjoy the happy reflections consequent on a well-spent life, and die in the hope of a glorious immortality. Question. What are the second class of emblems? Answer. The spade, coffin, death head, marrow bones, and sprig of cassia, which are thus explained, the spade opens the vault to receive our bodies, where our active limbs will soon moulder to dust. The coffin, death head, and marrow bones, are emblematical of the death and burial of our Grand Master, Hiram our beef, and are worthy our serious attention. The sprig of cassia is emblematical of that immortal part of man which never dies, and when the cold winter of death shall have passed, and the bright summer's morn of the resurrection appears, the Son of Righteousness shall descend, and send forth his angels to collect our ransomed dust, then, if we are found worthy, by his password, we shall enter into the celestial lodge above, where the supreme architect of the universe presides, where we shall see the king in the beauty of holiness, and with him. Enter into an endless eternity. Here ends the three first degrees of masonry, which constitute a master mason's lodge. A master mason's lodge and a chapter of royal archmasons, are two distinct bodies, wholly independent of each other. The members of a chapter are privileged to visit all Master Mason's lodges when they please, and may be, and often are, members of both at the same time, and all the members of a Master Mason's lodge who are Royal Archmasons, though not members of any chapter, may visit any chapter. I wish the reader to understand that neither all Royal Archmasons nor Master Masons are members of either lodge or chapter, there are tens of thousands who are not members, and scarcely ever attend, although privileged to do so. A very small proportion of Masons, comparatively speaking, ever advance any further than the third degree, and consequently never get the great word which was lost by Hiram's untimely death. Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and Hiram Arbif, the widow's son, having sworn that they, nor neither of them, would ever give the word, except they three were present. And it is generally believed, that there was not another person in the world, at that time, that had it, consequently the word was lost, and supposed to be forever, but the sequel will show it was found after a lapse of 470 years, notwithstanding, the word Mahabon, which was substituted by Solomon, still continues to be used by master masons, and no doubt will, as long as masonry attracts the attention of men, and the word which was lost, is used in the royal arch degree. What was the word of the royal arch degree, before they found the master's word, which was lost at the death of Hiram Arbif, and was not found for 470 years? 
Were there any royal archmasons before the master's word was found? I wish some Masonic gentleman would solve these two questions. The ceremonies, history, and the lecture, in the preceding degree, are so similar, that, perhaps, some one of the three might have been dispensed with, and the subject well understood by most readers, notwithstanding there is a small difference between the work and history, and between the history and the lecture. I shall now proceed with the Mark Master's degree, which the first degree in the chapter. The Mark Master's degree, the past masters, and the most excellent masters, are lodges of Mark Master Masons, past master, and most excellent master, yet, although called lodges, they are called component parts of the chapter. Ask a Mark Master Mason if he belongs to the chapter, he will tell you he does, but that he has only been marked. It is not an uncommon thing, by any means, for a chapter to confer all four of the degrees in one night, viz., the Mark Master, Past Master, Most Excellent Master, and Royal Arch Degrees. Test Oath and Word. The following test oath and word were invented and adopted by the Grand Lodge of the State of New York, at their session in June, 1827, for the purpose of guarding against bookmasons. They are given in a master's lodge. They were obtained from a gentleman in high standing in society, and among masons, but a friend to anti-masonry. He was a member of the Grand Lodge, and present when they were adopted. A person, wishing to be admitted into the lodge, presents himself at the door, the tiler, or some brother from within, demands, or asks, do you wish to visit this lodge? The candidate for admission, says, if thought worthy. Tyler. By what are you recommended? Answer. By fidelity. Tyler says, prove that, at the same time advances and throws out his hand, or arm, to an angle of about 45 degrees obliquely forward, the hand open, and thumb upward. The candidate then advances, and places the back of his left hand against the palm of the tiler's right hand, still extended, puts his mouth to the tiler's ear, and whispers, L-O-S, and pronounces, loss. Note. This word is an inversion of Sol, the sun, and is very applicable as a Masonic test, the light of masonry being fast retrograding towards its native darkness. Test oath. I, a B, of my own free will and accord, in the presence of Almighty God, solemnly and sincerely promise and swear, that I will not communicate the secret test word, annexed to this obligation, to any but a true and lawful master mason, and that in the body of a lawful lodge of such, in actual session, or at the door of a lodge for the purpose of gaining admission, under the penalty of being forever disgraced and dishonored as a man, and despised, degraded, and expelled as a mason.